thank you for uh, coming to uh, this uh, very uh, important and prestigious visiting professorship. Um, before I start, uh, I just want to uh, make uh, one introduction. Many of you uh, have not had the fortune yet of meeting our new chair of plastic surgery, Dr. Scott Hollenbeck. Scott, please stand up. And so Scott joined us from Duke. Um, see, you know, that'll never happen. Orthopedics happen for plastic surgeons. You never know. So, so Dr. Hollenbeck, Hollenbeck joined us from uh, Duke uh, in November. Uh, he's a, a, a renowned uh, microsurgeon who does uh, oncologic and, and breast reconstruction. So uh, he has been tasked with continuing to grow our plastic surgery department. So uh, I'm glad uh, Dr. Hollenbeck is here and, and was able to join us last night for our dinner. So many of you know about this uh, visiting professorship. This is the 13th annual visiting uh, professorship, the Mc, uh, Morgan McHugh visiting professorship in hand surgery. It was named after uh, the two uh, legends that started our hand fellowship program. Uh, Dr. Morgan is here, uh, here at the in the front row. Many of you uh, remember him uh, when and he retired not too long ago. He was chair of the plastic surgery department here for 29 years. And uh, he and Dr. Uh, McHugh, uh, as uh, many uh, in this building and many in the orthopedic department know, Dr. McHugh was a mentor uh, to, to so many of us, and he passed away uh, uh, over 10 years ago. But Dr. McHugh and Morgan started the first hand fellowship program here in 1992. And then we started the second position in 2010. So we've had two fellows for the last uh, 13 years. Um, but this is the 13th year of this visiting professorship uh, that was uh, started uh, in honor of Dr. Uh, uh, Morgan and McHugh and what they did to build the foundation for hand surgery here at UVA. So uh, I'm excited to speak our uh, to introduce our our visiting speaker, who's a rising star in in, in the hand society world, Dr. Daniel Osei uh, from from Hospital for Special Surgery. Uh, he's an associate professor at Cornell. Dr. Osei uh, is um, uh, did his undergrad at Princeton University, where he played soccer. Uh, Dan came to town a little early and, and we, uh, we, uh, toured around Charlottesville, uh, yesterday. The last time he, uh, was here was in 1999 when Princeton lost to Virginia in overtime. So he had a little PTSD when I drove him by Clockner stadium yesterday, but he hasn't been to Charlottesville since. Uh, so, uh, it was great to kind of show him around yesterday, but he, he did his undergrad at Princeton. I uh, did his, uh, med school at Penn. Uh, residency at HSS and, and fellowship in hand and upper extremity at Wash U. And then he did a micro, additional microsurgery training in Taiwan. He um, started uh, his clinical practice at, uh, his, at Wash U, but then uh, moved to HSS about five years ago. He's the fellowship director at HSS and is a, a very well-funded researcher. Dr. Weiss, there's like 16 chairs up here, so you can sit up here, you know. People, you guys can come up front. I don't know what you guys are worried about here. Um, you better put all those chairs back in the cafeteria. So, but, um, so, uh, uh, Dr. Ose is very well funded. He, he has, he's NIH funded on this topic, actually, cubital tunnel syndrome. Uh, he's a, a very prolific researcher. Uh, he's the director of the Research Management Committee for the ASSH. He and I work together as on the Hand Fellowship Directors Association, where he is the chair of that association now. And um, just a, he's a member of the ASSH Council. And in 2015, he won the Richard Gelberman ASSH Research Scholar Award. Uh, so he's a very uh, up and rising star in the Hand Society world, uh, a great role model from an academic standpoint, has a very busy clinical practice, hand, wrist, elbow, mi uh, microsurgery, peripheral nerve. Uh, and he's uh, uh, very uh, involved uh, in the hand society. And as I mentioned, a very uh, prolific researcher. So he's a, a great faculty member uh, at, to, as a, for a role model. He'll be talking about cubital tunnel syndrome. And then his next lecture will be about his career, uh, his journey uh, to the point of a mid-career faculty member and some advice he has for all of us. So thank you, Dr. Osei, for being here. And again, thank you, Dr. Morgan, of course, Dr. McHugh, and Dr. Hollenbeck for supporting this lectureship.
Well, that was an incredibly kind uh, introduction. Thanks, Bobby. It's been really uh, wonderful to be here over the past 18 hours or so. Uh, I think uh, Bobby did a good job of, of uh, giving away one of the things that's in the second slide, which is, or sorry, the second talk, which is my last, uh, my, my last trip to Charlottesville was maybe a little less fun uh, than this one has been thus far. But really, I've had a, a great time getting to know a lot of the uh, department uh, residents uh, and faculty, as well as just uh, touring around Charlottesville. It's really uh, a wonderful place. I, I can see why Bobby's been so proud of uh, what you guys have all accomplished together. Um, but certainly honored to be here uh, as part of this uh, lectureship. Uh, I know many of the uh, prior um, folks that have come here as part of this lectureship, and uh, really it's, it's a true honor. So thank you, Bobby. Um, the first topic, I'm well aware this is a, a mixed uh, orthopedics and plastics group, some of whom probably think nothing about the ulnar nerve. Uh, but as Bobby said, I, I've been thinking a lot about the ulnar nerve over a long period of time. Uh, and I think even if you are not a hand surgeon, even if you're not a nerve surgeon, there are some principles here that I think fit a lot of uh, some of the clinical dilemmas um, that we all face in uh, practice. And so hopefully there's a little something in here for everybody, but this is a really good way to, to think about um, a hard clinical problem for which there are no good uh, gold standard uh, diagnostic tools. All right. So a lot of the time, uh, and I think this is really good from the resident perspective, we talk about lots of things with great deals of certainty. Uh, and we've all done it ourselves. We've all certainly seen people talk in this way. And it's something that I've always felt somewhat allergic to, you know, this idea that I am certain or this happens all the time or this never happens. None of these things are true, right? And so I've always thought that the dogma that has been uh, that is really steeped into everything that we do can be a real detriment. And so I think I, I just like to encourage, particularly the trainees, to think critically about everything that we think we know uh, and, and try to avoid dogma to the extent possible. So how does that relate to the ulnar nerve? Well, there's lots of conferences that I'm sure you've been in discussing all sorts of issues related to the ulnar nerve. And this is a classic article from uh, the OT uh, S journal, uh, where they talked about should you transpose an ulnar nerve in the setting of internal fixation of the distal humerus. And lots of, you know, well-known uh, orthopedic trauma specialists were part of this group. And what did they find? They found that ulnar nerve dysfunction happens about a third of the time with transposition, but only 9% um, of the time with decompression. And so they sort of concluded that you should do less of the ulnar nerve in the setting of orthopedic distal humerus trauma. Uh, they also found a four times higher rate of reoperation when you transpose the nerve. And so we actually have a lot of combined conferences, upper extremity trauma, and this is literally every single time we get together, this is one of the topics, what should you do with the ulnar nerve? And depending on who you are and how you do it, I think you have a different perspective. Here's a paper that was written a little bit more from a hand surgery perspective, also in the uh, um, OTS journal. Uh, but they found in this one, it was more of a natural history study of what happens to the ulnar nerve when left kind of in place. And they found that pretty high percentage, 16% will end up getting mild to moderate ulnar neuropathy by 12 months post-op. So what this says to me is that if you try to treat the ulnar nerve with essentially benign neglect, you're going to have a high percentage of, of folks that will end up with ulnar nerve dysfunction. Uh, so clearly, um, distal radius, uh, sorry, distal humerus fractures are a huge risk factor for ulnar nerve pathology. So what do you do? You kind of have different approaches here. And inevitably, most of us in the hand world will say, well, if you have a trauma specialist handle the ulnar nerve, uh, that might have been part of the problem of why they don't do so well. And that's why you found that doing less than nerve ends up being a better thing. Still don't know if any of this is true, but at least it gives us reason to, to think. And so it's not just in nerve, it's not just in hand world, it's everywhere, right? So DVT prophylaxis, how many times have we talked about, you know, the pulmonology perspective versus the joint surgeon perspective? You know, nine liters of irrigation, where does that come from? 
I mean, there's there's not any justification for these things. The use of tourniquet in tumor infection cases, are you really squeezing bacteria into the systemic uh, circulation? I haven't seen a paper that tells me that that's true. Um, how do you treat the pink pulseless hand? Uh, you know, again and again, we go in these circles and, you know, depending on how you're trained, who trained you, you know, you believe things with a lot of certainty, but where's the evidence, right? And so that's a big problem when we have to make important decisions that affect our patients. And so again, you know, this is obviously a uh, department uh, wide talk, but, you know, a lot of trainees in the room, I really encourage you guys to think through a lot of these things and it's okay to question. So funny kind of situation, I, uh, I'm one of the associate editors for Journal of Hand Surgery. There was a paper uh, written about, interestingly, I have a mallet finger. This was on uh, bony mallet uh, uh, fractures. And essentially the authors, you know, made a lot of presuppositions that were not based in any truth, not really justified by the data that were presented, and then created a lot of conclusions that if accepted, end up being things that you see like on your OITE and become kind of, again, part of orthopedic uh, dogma. And it drove me crazy. I uh, sort of was the grumpy guy in the group of three reviewers and I lost the battle, um, but was offered kind of this opportunity to kind of write a commentary, which, you know, I think that that's a little bit out of fashion these days, but certainly I think there's a role. And so, the, the one thing that I think was useful is this, this concept that, you know, I kind of created here and, and why it really should be avoided. You know, we, we see that there's been an explosion of journals, right? Not just in orthopedics, not just in medicine, but everywhere. Uh, the whole sort of um, peer review uh, process has led to lots of folks who don't really know that much about the topic opining on whether or not the manuscript being submitted really deserves to be in circulation. And so a lot of things get through that are, you know, probably not true. And so the reader then, you know, assumes that the study is valid because it's peer reviewed. Uh, then the reader assumes that if the study is internally valid, then it's probably externally valid, meaning that it applies, the findings apply to their patients. And that's how you create dogma. And it's really, really hard to undo that once uh, it has been thrown out into the universe. And so, you know, be a um, contrarian. I think it's really important. Uh, it's the kind of idea that, you know, we accept more beta error uh, than alpha error. Uh, so making the assumption that something is true just because it's said can be dangerous. All right. So getting back to the ulnar nerve, what kind of dogma do we hear? I hear this all the time. I've never had to revise a case all decompressions do great. It's a simple case. It's basically the same as carpal tunnel syndrome, but at the elbow. Uh, and to motor ulnar transfers always work. They actually almost always do. But um, these are things that you hear all the time. Um, when I was in St. Louis, we had looked at our ulnar nerve population and uh, sort of created, you know, sort of a prospective cohort. And one thing that we had noticed is that decompressions really didn't do as well as we thought they did. Uh, and we ended up reporting about a 20% rate of patients not being so happy. And we revised most of those cases. And a lot of folks gave us a hard time, both at the journal level, but also at conferences and things of this nature. And I remember uh, this paper coming out in short order after uh, we had reported our findings on a 3% revision rate. You know, one of the things that is certainly true is that if you don't ask a patient if they're still experiencing numbness and tingling, they're not going to necessarily tell you. Um, and so this idea about, you know, how well do patients do, you know, that's a big deal, especially as, you know, again, for the trainees, you're going to be out there talking to patients. And one of the reasons that I like epidemiological research is because it relates to very basic questions that patients really want to know. How likely am I to do well? You know, do I, am I more at risk for doing poorly or am I in kind of the good group? These are, you know, bread and butter kind of very important questions that come out of epidemiological studies. So it is really important, even if sometimes seen as boring. 
And so this was uh, the paper I was referring to. We had 19% of our cohort over about a four to five year period ended up undergoing revision. And when you looked at that group, one of the classic pieces of dogma and ulnar nerve um, research is that the presence of hypermobility or subluxation of the ulnar nerve at the medial epicondyle will lead to persistent symptoms if you just simply decompress rather than transpose the ulnar nerve. And when we looked at this cohort of folks that ended up undergoing revision, that really wasn't the problem. Uh, in fact, only 11% of them uh, ended up having uh, subluxation in terms of intraoperative findings at the time of their revision surgery. Most of them uh, ended up having a substantial amount of adhesion formation around the nerve, sometimes kind of plastering it against the medial epicondyle, sometimes in the forearm fascia between the two heads of the FCU, and sometimes you know above the retrocondylar groove kind of along the side of the humerus. And so this just seemed to be something intrinsic to decompression of the ulnar nerve, where a lot of patients will still do well, but in our cohort, 20% of them did not. And so, you know, what's going on here? Because when you look uh, overall um, in terms of what is being done for the ulnar nerve, I would say probably 90, maybe even higher than 90% of surgery for ulnar nerve uh, pathology is really decompression uh, in 2023. And there are several studies that show that it was probably 50% in the mid 90s, and it has really risen uh, to above 90% at this point. Um, this group, uh, led by uh, Dr. Padua uh, in Florence, uh, has been one of the foremost groups in terms of ulnar nerve uh, research. And they did a really nice job. We've all seen the Cochrane database systematic reviews of kind of looking at sort of what does the literature say about outcomes, how people do following ulnar nerve surgery. Um, and really, it was only about 70% of patients that did either good or excellent following surgery. And that, again, flies in the face of what most surgeons will tell you, that all my patients do well. Uh, and so I actually tell every patient that this is what the literature says, 70%, and they're kind of horrified because they want it to be like their hip replacement, you know, 92, 95% excellent outcomes, and it just isn't so. Question that is relevant is why, but this is where we are. And so this is kind of what I was referring to. There's a lot of hints here that things are a little bit interesting uh, from an ulnar nerve perspective, and this is really what led me to think about this problem in general. Uh, I re referenced this Sultani um, uh, manuscript where you look in 1994, about 50% of surgery done for the ulnar nerve uh, was transposition and 50% was decompression. That rose to a much higher percentage, about two thirds decompression by 2026. And there are other studies, Kevin Chung uh, from uh, University of Michigan did a similar study uh, and it's risen to, as I said, above 90% decompression. But the other interesting thing is that when you look from 1994 to 2006, the, the number of cases being done has risen. Uh, and this reflected a UK study that was done over a fairly similar time period where this is basically the number of cases done per uh, diagnosis uh, created in sort of this uh, administrative database. And the thing I find super interesting about this paper is they actually had very, uh, very good control studies, to, sorry, control diagnoses to look at. So they chose trigger finger, carpal tunnel, and Dupuytren's contracture. And when you look at the rate of surgery done per diagnosis for those other uh, uh, conditions, it's flat, right? It doesn't change from 2000 to 2010. But look at the ulnar nerve, right? So from 2000 to 2010, there are more cases being done per diagnosis created, right? So wh why should that be? Is there some uh, thing happening in the atmosphere that's uh, going around compressing ulnar nerves, but leaving all these other things uh, totally fine? No, right? And so I would suggest that over time, we're seeing for the ulnar nerve, a gradual change in either the diagnostic criteria or the therapeutic criteria, meaning, you know, what is the threshold to operate? Um, and that tells us that we don't really know what's going on, 
right? So why should the criteria change if we, we're certain about what the uh, standards really should be? So my uh, synopsis of all this is that we treat it a lot. I mean, if you look at those numbers, you know, we're, you know, probably doing at this point about 100,000 cases a year. Um, we don't achieve excellent outcomes, right? 70% is not excellent. Um, we don't really know who's going to do well, like who are the people at risk for doing poorly. Uh, and it's probably because we don't really know how to define it truly, right? So this is a big problem. And that, to me, as I started to think about this problem from the beginning of my career, you know, 2012, why is that so uh, that we just have so many basic questions that remain unanswered about this condition? And so I started to break it down and, and you know, sort of this forms the, um, the, the way in which I kind of laid out sort of an epidemiological study of cubital tunnel syndrome that Dr. Chopper talked about from a, a funding standpoint. And, you know, it's always about the knowledge gap, right? So if any of you guys have, have uh, done any writing of grants, it's, it's always about defining the significance of the knowledge gap. And so there are just basic questions that, you know, I thought really needed to have a much more granular answer. How many people have it? You know, what are the characteristics of being associated uh, of having the condition or giving you increased odds of having the condition? And what is it really, right? So we, we sort of know what it is. Uh, you know, if, if I were to ask any resident in the room, they'd be able to give me an answer. But if I really asked you to be very specific about what cubital tunnel is, and what it isn't, I think you'd have trouble, right? Is it really about the compression? Is it about the syndrome of pain paresthesias? Uh, is it about having intrinsic atrophy, but there's plenty of patients that don't have it? You know, do you need to have positive findings on studies? Well, a lot of studies are negative, so it, it becomes a little bit challenging. Um, and so, you know, trying to get at the first two questions, um, again, if you're trying to create a study, you know, a lot of these things require population prevalence studies in order to get at um, basically rates of um, how people are affected. And the reason that's important is because when you try to understand um, the value of your diagnostic study, you really have to understand the prevalence, right? So uh, a high prevalence um, condition is going to affect the sort of positive predictive value of your diagnostic test in a low prevalence condition, it's gonna to be totally different. So you really have to understand the burden of disease in the population. Um, from the second two questions, I think it was a little bit more challenging and I realized that we just don't have reliable diagnostic studies to really get at what it really is. In other words, we don't have a biomarker. We don't have a blood test. When you look at the you know, false negative rates for things like nerve conduction studies are quite high. So we really have to figure out better ways to understand what is the mark of a patient that has compressive ulnar neuropathy that leads to this syndrome. And so that's kind of why I started looking at ultrasound back in, in 2012. It certainly has become more popular. Just a show of hands for anybody that has seen a patient with ulnar neuropathy. Does anybody use ultrasound here? Sort of, friend? A lot, a little? So right now you're currently just using it for hypermobility. Do you, So as it stands right now, is it something that you could take or leave, but doesn't really change how you treat the patient? Or is this a fundamental yeah, part? Like, it's usually one of those. You get the information, but often don't So let's see if we can uh, change your opinion there. All right. So as I said, diagnostic test accuracy relates strongly to the prevalence rates. And so that's why we kind of needed some of this baseline information that now we're using as we're trying to hone in on better ways to improve the diagnostic accuracy. And again, being uh, somebody that wants to be a little bit more precise about this, the lack of a gold standard 
comparison is very hard. If you look in the orthopedic literature at lots of different studies of diagnostic accuracy, they almost always have a benchmark against which a new test is compared. So it may be, you know, um, MRI for rotator cuff tears. And for instance, Ken Yamaguchi, one of my former mentors at WashU, used a lot of ultrasound there. And so in order to establish the effectiveness of ultrasound, he did several studies looking at MRI as a benchmark or even arthroscopy as a benchmark. Uh, we don't really have the luxury of that with the ulnar nerve, so it becomes a little bit more challenging, but we're getting there. So, you know, we did this study on uh, the prevalence, you know, looked at about a thousand uh, subjects in uh, the St. Louis area and, you know, basically hid the fact that we were looking for ulnar neuropathy, which is really important, right? Uh, and so we, we did several things, you know, nerve conduction studies, uh, general um, assessment with PROMs, that kind of thing. And, and what we found is that, you know, again, it really depends on how you define the condition, which is part of the problem. But it's somewhere between <clears throat> probably 2 and 5% of the population uh, and quite a bit more prevalent relative to carpal tunnel syndrome than oftentimes is reported. You'll all hear people say it's like 10 times less common than carpal tunnel. And that's not what we found in this you know, fairly robust uh, patient uh, or su subject um, sort of assessment. So it's more common than you realize. Show of hands, how many people have uh, numbness and tingling in the ring finger and small finger when they either flex their elbow up or put their arm in the forearm? It's, uh, it's a common problem. Now, when does it become something that you have to treat? Well, that's why this is important. So again, this is important for establishing pretest probability for future diagnostic test studies. We looked at the incidence a little bit less important, but again, you know, it's still pretty high. You know, when you look at most incidence rates of carpal tunnel, you're going to see rates around 100 per um, 100,000 is pretty common. So again, it's, it's not quite as, um, it's not so much the, uh, the, the little, uh, you know, redheaded stepchild of carpal tunnel is pretty common. It does increase with age and, and maybe with male gender, but honestly, um, the rates are pretty similar across um, across gender. Uh, the risk of surgery was higher with age, but probably related to the years of disease burden lived with. So people just get tired of living with a problem the longer they've lived with it. One of the issues that has confounded me for a long time is, you know, what does my surgical cohort really look like? How do they differ from people that I'm able to treat non-operatively? One of the things that we found in that incident study is that about 40% of patients will end up having surgery within a year of the time of their initial diagnosis by a neurologist or an orthopedic surgeon or, you know, a nerve surgeon, plastic surgeon. So, you know, what's the difference, right? And this study was interesting in that essentially there is no difference between the pa patients that are able to be treated non-operatively and the patients that are able to be treated operatively. Certainly on the severe end, there's no doubt somebody with horrible intrinsic atrophy um, is going to be a different animal. But I'm talking about patients before they have atrophy. There's really not much difference. You know, this cohort, small cohort, you know, they had similar two-point discrimination um, they had the same kind of uh, cross-sectional area findings and um, the same uh, conduction velocity decreases um, relative to the non-surgical group. Really, the biggest difference is that they complain more about night symptoms. That was the only thing that was different. Uh, and not surprising, right? The patient who complains and comes back and complains, they're going to get surgery, right? Which is sort of upsetting in a way to me because that suggests that we have a lot of diagnostic and treatment variability. Uh, we're not treating everybody the same in terms of the pathology. We're treating them differently based on how much they are irritating us by their complaints. Not good in, as far as I'm concerned. Another thing that we sort of looked at and kind of debunked, there are several studies out there over the last 10 years that have looked at the correlation between patient reported symptoms physical examination, and then diagnostic testing, such as nerve conduction studies. Uh, and that's been actually validated several times. So one of the things that we did was we ended up saying, what happens if we blind the examiner 
to the patient's history and their complaints? What happens then? And the answer is that not surprisingly, their physical exam and their um, patient reported symptoms are no longer correlated. And so what that tells us is that things like bias and everybody has probably at this point heard of like thinking fast and thinking slow, Dan Kahneman uh, and Amos Tversky won a uh, Nobel prize for their you know, founding of behavioral economics and all these heuristics that we use in day-to-day -day, uh, life to basically simplify decision-making, but oftentimes lead to bias. We certainly, in a patient that complains of numbness and tingling in the ring and small finger, probably tap just a little bit harder on the ulnar nerve and rate something as a positive finding when we expect to find it, right? And so that's a pretty big finding, right? Because we oftentimes will talk about things like carpal tunnel syndrome or cubital tunnel syndrome as clinical diagnoses. Uh, and a master clinician should be able to figure these things out, but perhaps we're really just using the patient history to help us confirm our preconception. And that has been um, important uh, for my thinking as well, because I, I would love to say that it's just a clinical diagnosis, but it just hasn't proven um, to be that for me. This is something that it's actually borrowed from a slide of a, of a um, talk that I give to our trainees, our fellows and residents. And this concept, and this is a kind of a, a Rorschach uh, ink blot of what is cubital tunnel syndrome. Do you define it by its sort of um, objective uh, pathophysiology that it's compression of, of a, a nerve at the elbow? Or do you think of it in syndromic terms? It's about the pain, the paresthesias, the numbness, maybe the weakness caused by that entrapment. And then this third question, does it matter? Um, I think it does matter because the way you define it is going to then determine the kind of testing that you do to try to say, does the person have it, yes or no? And I've asked this question to a lot of senior, very prominent hand surgeons, and it's split. You know, some people think that you treat the test, essentially. Somebody comes in, conduction velocity is 30 meters per second across the elbow. That person has cubital tunnel syndrome. And your job is to prevent worsening atrophy, intrinsic loss, all these kind of things that may come from that decreased conduction velocity. Other folks will say, if the patient's not complaining and they're able to do everything uh, that they want to and notice no difference, then they don't have cubital tunnel and you know, come back when you need me. But those are real questions, right? And you can't kind of pick and choose and go back and forth. You have to have some kind of paradigm uh, on which you kind of make decisions so that you're not differentially treating patients, uh, because otherwise you will start making mistakes. And so when I talked in the beginning about perhaps this being a model that you can use in other areas of orthopedics or plastic surgery, this is kind of what I mean, right? I mean, I think you have to think about the big picture and how you see something so that you can make consistent decisions. So going back to the um, concept of this being a clinical diagnosis, Roy Beekman is somebody that I've visited. He's um, a, a, a neurologist that has spent a lot of time thinking about the ulnar nerve. He uh, lives in Southern Holland. He's written extensively in journals that probably very few of you read, things like muscle nerve and neurology, uh, but really interesting findings that really kind of formed the basis of a lot of my ideas about the ulnar nerve. And he showed this a long time ago, actually, that when you look at the clinical assessment of uh, ulnar neuropathy, we are terrible uh, in terms of being able to identify affected patients. And so even though that was sort of maybe not what you hear at the hand Society meeting, um, it's, it's out there, just like anything. So anytime, this is for the, the trainees, you think that you have a novel idea, it's probably not. Uh, it just might be in a different language or, you know, just missed on PubMed. So just look a little, a little bit harder. Uh, but if you look at the classic kind of uh, provocative test that we do, I mean, they're all pretty poor in terms of, um, you know, the, uh, the sensitivity, 62%, 61%, and 32%. And you know, that, that's not the basis on which you can kind of uh, distinguish affected and unaffected people. There are a lot of other studies like this. You know, if you look at kind of a natural uh, history study, Lee Dillon has done, you know, led the way in terms of peripheral neuropathy um, and peripheral nerve issues for 
uh, many years, uh, he basically showed that in his cohort, 11% of patients with negative studies had failure of non-operative treatment. So one out of 10 patients that come to you and say, look, everything's negative, they have it and they really need surgery. But if you look at the folks that have positive findings, how many of them end up needing surgery? Well, only about 40% of them ended up needing surgery, despite having tests that show that they have, quote unquote, ulnar neuropathy. So the tests that we <clears throat> currently use do not do a good job of figuring out, will this person need my surgical care or not? So what's the purpose of that test? I don't know. So again, uh, leading you to this idea of uh, ultrasound, and, and I do think, you know, over the last 10 years, it really has helped me quite a bit. Um, this is me. This is uh, Roy Beekman uh, testing me. Uh, and it turns out that I have a snapping triceps that definitely pushes on my ulnar nerve, which is why I've had ulnar neuropathy for a long time. Um, well, what does the literature say? Well, Dr. Beekman, um, who I was just referencing, showed that from a diagnostic accuracy standpoint, actually, it's probably a little bit better than uh, your nerve conduction study, even you know, done uh, in a very rigorous kind of manner where you look at the likelihood ratios of having ulnar neuropathy um, and defining it by ultrasonographic measures versus uh, nerve conduction studies are so-called gold standard right now. Um, the positive likelihood ratios are higher and the negative likelihood ratios are, you know, more negative. So that is a, a more discriminating test relative to nerve conduction study. But the other thing that I think is really interesting uh, is that there seems to be a prognostic aspect to ultrasound that is a little bit harder to define on nerve conduction studies. So what do I mean? Bigger nerves are less likely to recover following surgery. So the, the worse the condition gets by ultrasonographic measures, there may be less likelihood of um, getting better after surgery. Not surprising, the more severe something is, you may see less um, uh, benefit to surgery. But what else happens? In patients who do achieve relief after surgery, the nerves get much smaller than the folks who don't achieve as much benefit after surgery. So there seems, again, to be this ability to use ultrasound to kind of see and chart how people are doing. It seems to be somewhat responsive. Um, to the changes uh, brought about by surgery. And patients who don't get better, as I said, if you look at the p-values here, uh, not significantly different between diagnosis and follow-up. So the prognostic aspect of ultrasound is particularly interesting to me as somebody who sees a lot of patients that come in for you know, second or third opinions and that kind of thing. But as I was kind of hinting at, there are several studies that show that as you get more severity of ulnar neuropathy from more of a demyelinating lesion. So that's kind of the early like neuropraxic kind of injury to having a sensory axonal loss. So those are patients that would have sort of a decreased sensory amplitude on their nerve conduction study. And then both sensory and motor loss. So their CMAPs, compound muscle action potentials are now decreased you see that the cross-sectional area of the nerve seems to get bigger and bigger and bigger. So it does seem to correlate with a greater severity of disease. So again, as we're trying to figure out, is this an effective tool? You're trying to you know, test it out and it seems to hit on a lot of different diagnostic and prognostic uh, marks. So here's an ultrasound. Dr. DeGeorge says he barely uses it, but kind of gets it some of the time. But one of the things that has happened over the last 15, 20 years is that we, we've seen uh, the um, I guess resolution of ultrasound improve. And as it's improved, you can really see more and more and more. So if you look at the um, you know, left side here, you, know, you have this what we call a hypoechoic area of the nerve. And that tends to be the area that is typically measured. But here, so we have a, a really um, good radiology uh, expert on nerve ultrasound. And she pointed out to me that although not conventional, she can really make out the epineurial rim uh, of the nerve. And she thinks, and I guess I kind of agree with her, although I asked her to prove it, that this is relevant to uh, some of the pathology that we see. It may improve our diagnostic accuracy. But here, I mean, you very much can see the different 
you know, bundles of the ulnar nerve um, here. And so this is a, a patient that has fascicular swelling in addition to an increased cross-sectional area relative to their unaffected side. Um, as Dr. George was talking about, one of the classic things we look at is this hypermobility. And I know this is probably going to not make any sense to a lot of folks, but just imagine that you're looking kind of at the, again, the retrocondylar groove. You can kind of palpate your medial epicondyle. You can palpate your olecranon. So ME is medial epicondyle, O is olecranon. And then you have this nerve kind of in the middle. And the nice thing about ultrasound is that it can be a dynamic exam. So you can examine somebody uh, in extension where the nerve tends to sit in the groove and then flex them up to see if the nerve starts to dislocate. Uh, and, you know, some patients will have the nerve remain in the groove and other patients will have the nerve dislocate out of the groove. And so that's a patient with a hypermobile nerve. The other thing is that you can see in this hypermobile nerve, you know, the nerve is quite a bit bigger than this normal control over here. So that's one of the findings that as we get more hypermobility, oftentimes patients will have uh, increased cross-sectional area. But you can see a lot of other things. You can see, this is my nerve, um, that the you know, medial triceps which sits just behind the ulnar nerve in the retrocondylar groove as you flex up can push the nerve out of the groove. And so you know, hypermobility can be caused by a lot of different things. It could be caused by a shallow groove. It could be caused by previous trauma. Uh, it could be caused by scar tissue. And it can be caused by this medial triceps, again, pushing on the ulnar nerve from the backside. Um, it is complicated, though, right? So this is a patient that has, on the left side, um, you can kind of see that the nerve kind of perches on the top of the medial epicondyle and kind of the faces. I'll just run that one more time if I can. Um, if faces are flattened on the tops, that's why the patient's getting symptoms. But on the other side, they, they never get over to the top of the hump, right? And so this is a patient that I actually didn't transpose. I ended up excising the medial triceps, decompressing the nerve, and it was stable, right? So I would never have known that without the ultrasound. It would have just seemed like normal hypermobility of the ulnar nerve, but it was clear on the ultrasound what was causing the hypermobility. So that's, you know, again, something quite valuable as uh, a surgical decision-making tool. Brian Calfey, my former partner in St. Louis, you know, did show that um, hypermobility is quite common. About a third of patients without symptoms will have hypermobility of the ulnar nerve. They'll feel even a little bit of a snap, but they don't have any numbness, tingling, or certainly intrinsic function uh, problems. So is hypermobility a problem in and of itself? It's really actually hard to know. You know, oftentimes we'll say that uh, it is the problem, but maybe it's just a, a red herring. I actually don't think that we're that much further along than we were back in 2010 when he wrote this uh, article. But one thing that is true is that, and I remember I was doing a symposium with Peter Stern, um, who probably several people here know. I know Dr. Chabra is quite close with him. And I told him that I thought a nerve that rises on top of the medial epicondyle but doesn't dislocate out, that patient definitely needs a transposition. And he said he never transposes his patients, that he always just decompressed them. Uh, and it's funny because he's a very um, diplomatic person, and I was actually surprised that he called me out on the stage, but I actually just felt way more strongly about it, um, and so I kind of, you know, pushed back, and, and again, why did I say that? It's because of the ultrasound, right? You can see the morphology change as the nerve is getting flattened. That has to be something that bothers the patient. And so the paradigm shifts as you get more information. So again, you know, keep on searching for ways to improve what it is that you think you're looking at and what it is that you are trying to diagnose. So um, I think ultrasound is great. I would actually encourage all of you guys in certain, certainly the hand group, uh, classic surgery group to consider doing it. I've found that it has really improved my understanding of what's going on in my patients. Uh, and every little bit that we do that improves that um, is, is really important. So, for instance, I can't remember who it was that I was talking about this topic with last week, but somebody asked me, I think it was one of my former fellows, how often do I go to the operating room and I change my plan from decompression to transposition? And I told him maybe 10% of the time. 
And he said, wow, it feels like, you know, I can never even tell. And I told him, let me think about this. When I started practice, it was probably a coin flip. And the difference is ultrasound, right? So now I get an ultrasound on every single patient preoperatively, just as Dr. DeGeorge was talking about kind of assessing for um, hypermobility. But it's not just hypermobility. It's how the nerve kind of moves even within the groove. So you can tell some patients when you start to flex the nerve, rather than pushing against the medial epicondyle, they actually just rise out of the groove. And then the nerve starts to become hypermobile. That patient, I bet, I haven't had the guts to do it. I bet that patient doesn't need a transposition because what's not happening is that they're not having the nerve push against the medial epicondyle, efface and flatten, and then roll over that hard surface. So I think a lot of those patients that just rise out of the groove first and then move, it's a little bit like doing a medial epicondylectomy where you, you know, essentially, again, I know a lot of you guys don't think about all the nerve stuff, but you can do this procedure where you essentially cut off the portion of the medial epicondyle that doesn't have um, the ulnar collateral ligament. And so the nerve just glides effortlessly back and forth without kind of having mechanical symptoms against the um, medial epicondyle. So I think that those patients are already kind of acting like that kind of scenario. Um, so my point is that it's complementary. It's not going to replace what you're already doing. It's a great education tool for you, for your patients. Patients love it. You know, they can kind of see it. It makes sense to them. Um, it's quick and painless. And I think, again, it's just about getting data and about getting better answers. And so I would say try it. It's been very helpful to me, certainly continuing to be an area in development, but uh, it's made my, my life and my practice of ulnar nerve uh, surgery a lot better. So thanks. So I'll start off questions. Um, so how do you transpose? What's your, uh, you train at Watch U, so do you do the transmuscular transposition? Uh, good question. So I would say um, I do a lot of different things. I would say right now, and it has changed, I probably do about 20% submuscular, although I've changed my technique. Uh, interestingly, to more like Susan McKinnon, which is more of an intramuscular technique. Uh, I found that I was starting to get a few patients, particularly those with some arthritis, that when you kind of lift up the whole flexor pronator mass and then, you know, put it back down, they kind of get pain between the elbow joint and the muscle as the muscle kind of contracts. And I found that the patients do better with just kind of burying it in muscle. Uh, but about 20% of that, about 15%. Uh, subcutaneous transposition, and I use a back flap and not a, a fascial sling, and then the rest are, are decompressions. Questions? I'm going to stand up so everybody can hear me. Uh, Daniel, I really enjoyed your talk. Question more about the research approach and just generally thinking about things. The idea of challenging dogma, uh, I think that's very important. I know everybody picked up on that. As you talk about addressing this problem and looking at it in multiple ways and defining the criteria, which I totally agree with you, is very important to have criteria so we can avoid picking and choosing which patients operate on, which leads to all sorts of bias, whether it's insurance or implicit bias, et cetera. So I think that is very important. But on the other side, you have the patient input and the idea of patient decision making. You mentioned briefly patient reported outcome. Metrics, which I do believe are, are important. We've been part of developing uh, the LIMQ as a plug, uh, which I hope will help us in determining limb salvage versus amputation going forward. That's about to come out. Um, but in, in this kind of problem, these nerve related problems, or even hand surgery in general, what's the role of patient in the decision making process as well as patient reported outcomes? Thank you. Uh, it's, a, it's a great question. And it's honestly why. 10 years later, I'm still working on it. Um, so I think everybody in the room knows that, uh, you know, surgery is not like medicine where you can, you know, quantify the effectiveness of, you know, one medication for hypertension versus another, right? I think it's, it can become quite challenging to do a randomized trial. I mean, certainly there are some, Dr. George has quite a few, but in many things, there has to be patient input, right? So for me, I think the things that I do, and you know, probably it's kind of beyond the top of this um, 
conversation, but I agree with Dr. Hollenbeck. I think one of the biggest things that has been a challenge is getting a standardized way to evaluate every patient. And it's not just from a testing like nerve conduction studies and ultrasound, which we had to standardize and had to work with our radiology group to do it the exact same way with measurements at every place, but it's also the physical examination. So, you know, everybody has to examine every aspect of what we are hoping to assess and then test for effect size on, uh, from range of motion to provocative tests to the way that we are doing our, you know, strength testing to the two-point discrimination, sometimes wine scene monofilament testing. So that's really important. If you don't have the same in information from the beginning, then what are you actually comparing? You don't, you don't really know. But the other part of it is um, that the way we're doing it, you know, again, probably too far down the road, but what we're really trying to do is create like a diagnostic prediction rule. Um, and so we're going to be collecting, and we have been collecting all this information in a standardized way, including those patient reported outcomes. And there's some related to nerve, there's some related to, you know, just upper extremity function. And essentially what I'm trying to figure out with the ultrasound piece, and that's where it's really interesting, is things like the ratio of cross-sectional area kind of in the mid-humerus to, say, at the elbow level, um, hypermobility, um, the fascicular swelling, the epidural thickening. And essentially, I'm trying to create a score, essentially, that I think should correlate very well with how severely the patients clinically present. And then maybe, I'm not sure if it'll... Um, you know, relate to outcomes or not, but that's kind of the second piece of it. So, um, again, for something where there's not a gold standard diagnosis, um, prediction scores which actually are used quite heavily in general surgery. Uh, and we don't use them that much in orthopedics, but I think it's a really nice way. It's, you know, Dr. Chopper and I were talking a little bit about deterministic versus probabilistic thinking, which is another kind of inter topic of interest for me. This kind of Bayesian inference where rather than saying, this blood test says the patient has it, you kind of collect certain things that give a patient like a 95% probability of having it, which is, sounds the same, but it's not quite the same. I think that's the right approach for something for which we don't have a gold standard diagnosis. And yeah, that was a great talk. I know anytime like the faculty in the room were texting me stuff and ideas, things, you've generated a lot of thought in here. So I think that's awesome. Uh, I think the idea of a prediction score is super cool. Like you think of a CTS-6 for a carpal tunnel. There's nothing like that for a cubital tunnel. I think the issue that is a lot of it's like we don't even agree on definitions or phenomena. Like when you talked about the concept of you know, perched or a sublux nerve, like and the, the different hand surgeons in the room would probably all give you a different definition of what that is. And then I would love to see some sort of correlation because you seem to think that that hypermobility of the perching or however you want to define it uh, is a reason to make an operative decision, uh, like transpose or not. I, I know a lot of people do that. The question is like, is there some way that we could figure out if that like truly is like, so I was wondering like, if just, is there some way to figure out if someone perches, does that change their electrodiagnostics or can we have someone perch for a period of time? enough that it causes some kind of transient neuropraxia that we could then detect or because then we would have real uh, a real reason to make an operative decision based on it because right now we just know that that phenomenon happens and you some people in the room would never transpose it some people would transpose it every time we don't really know if it does anything so I don't know. so that's a good question or good thought and i've thought about that as well um to your point about the, the CTS-6, that's another thing that we're doing. I, I decided, you know, enough laboring on about the ulnar nerve, but we're actually working on that right now. This is, um, we're, we're doing kind of just what Frank Graham did with um, his CTS-6, you know, using a Delphi method of, you know, experts all over the place. And we're using a little bit of a different technique um, here. Uh, it, it's something um, that one of our, you know, statisticians kind of thought it was a more modern way than what he did, but essentially creating different components uh, that seem to bundle together. And you can kind of get a sense of, you know, how much of the variance uh, is 
due to certain um, differences between one component and another. So we're actually you know, getting to the point that we're about to start doing what he did in the end, which is kind of test with vignettes. Um, so hopefully that's going to be helpful as well. But obviously the little sound score is going to be a, a little bit different. But getting back to your point, I, I bet there is probably a basic science way to kind of look at that. And I'm not the person to do that since that's not been my uh, area. Although I think it's a good idea to create a um, model. Um, my plan is to do, you know, again, I, I mentioned that Ken Yamaguchi, like for my K award when I was in St. Louis, I uh, had him as one of my mentors, and he did this longitudinal study of the rotator cuff, and he wanted to kind of understand what was the importance of identifying kind of this part of the rotator cuff tear, you know, at uh, time zero, but then over time, right? So I'm, I'm actually going to start following these patients over a long period of time. And I think to your point, if you document that somebody kind of purges, I mean, what does that nerve look like in a year and two years and five years, right? And so I'm also looking at sort of silent lesions, kind of like what Ken Yamaguchi was doing. A lot of patients that have, you know, increased cross-sectional area on their symptomatic side also have it maybe to a lesser degree on the other side. I don't know if you've noticed that. And so is that sort of a, you know, pre-clinical lesion, right, that ends up identifying at-risk nerves. Uh, and I think in that way, it's not quite a direct way to answer your question, but I think we might, in this cohort way, be able to. Yeah. One last question. Okay, keep it short, then. <laughs> yes, two part. <laughs> Thanks for your talk. Uh, Dave Weiss, one of the trauma surgeons here. And, uh, just to be clear, I don't have a dog in the fight about the transmission yeah. issue. Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, my question actually had to do a kind of a tag on to Scott's question about the diagnosis. So I think your, your point about uh, not having a clear diagnosis is, or a way to make a diagnosis is a good point. One of the issues, though, is once you, if you decide on a way to make the diagnosis, let's say you have come up with a, uh, a scale that helps make that diagnosis, I still don't think we understand what the best treatment is. Because if you say, well, you have a, di you have a swollen nerve, you've got your nerve is larger than it should be. But that doesn't necessarily mean that surgery is the right answer for that. There may be other ways to treat that. As you said, a, a fairly sizable portion of the, the patients will actually improve with non-operative management. And so trying to figure out, you know, who needs surgery, like you said, the person who shows up and continues to complain gets surgery. But, you know, the probability statistics would say some of those folks might get better if they just gave us enough time and bought into the non-operative treatment. So having the ability to sort of say, yeah, a variety of the, the a certain number of people will get better with this, and it's this time frame. We expect it at three months because I think if people know that, okay, I'm going to give this three months, and then you know, that can I think that can be very helpful if we have that data. Um, but this that was more of a comment. The second question was uh, given that adhesions are such a big play, such a big part in this, do you do anything with during a surgery to help reduce the risk of scar tissue forming? Because some people will naturally form more adhesions than others as part of their uh, just having surgery will create damage to that area. So, are there techniques? that help uh, decrease the amount of uh, scar tissue that might form? Both good comment questions. Um, your point is, is perfect. I would say, though, that one of the reasons that I've gone down this road is because I think in orthopedics, and I can't be classic, but certainly in orthopedics, we all love outcome studies. Does treatment one work better than treatment two? And the whole problem that sort of bothering me is we don't even know whether the patients that were preparing outcome one and outcome two are the same patients, right? So maybe treatment differences have to do with patient population differences that we didn't realize in the first place. And that's why getting clear diagnostic criteria before we do treatment studies to figure out you know, does this even need surgery is really important. So I think you're right. I think there are plenty of people that want to do those studies or have done those studies. And I think they're all flawed by the fact that we don't know whether we're comparing apples to apples. So, but you're right. I mean, I think the idea is to get diagnostic criteria first and then be able to do all those things to tell us how do we actually treat these patients. Um, the second question in terms of what we do, you know, soft tissue handling matters, right? And so when we're with the residents and uh, fellows, and I ask them not to, you know, absolutely mash on the nerve, not so much traction. You don't have to dissect out every fascicle. You, you know, all these little things matter. I, I mentioned that I use a subcutaneous fat flap uh, as opposed to a fascial sling, uh, whether it's kind of elevating the uh, 
uh, flexor coordinator fascia, or some people will use the intermuscular septum as a little sling. Uh, and I think that that's probably less likely to scar nerves like fat um, uh, compared to fascia. Um, and then I don't know whether this is true or not, but I tend to move my patients pretty quickly. Um, interesting, I, I remember Ryan Calfee always used to say, I, I've stopped splinting <laughs> even my submusculars, which seemed crazy to me. But I think it's towards that idea that you kind of want to get things mobilized and get even out of the area so that everything doesn't kind of sock back down. Does any of it actually make a difference? I'm not sure. Um, but those are some of my thoughts. But you might be able to tell an ultrasound if you're if you're doing longitudinal studies now, these folks you can probably see you're maybe able to see people who start in for it. It's a little hard to tell ultrasound. Not that it's sure. a little bit uh, subjective at some of these uh, views, but maybe some. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, we're actually doing a study right now um, that we're looking at all of our revision cases and comparing them to a cohort of patients, kind of age, sex, match kind of thing. See whether there's something about those patients that are different uh, that would be helpful from a predictive standpoint. And I, I don't have the information, but that's another kind of roundabout way to kind of get at, you know, are there certain things that lead to, say, these adhesions that I think become problematic. So, Dan, that's fantastic, your approach. and careers work on this and how you've been so thoughtful of trying to better define a problem. So congratulations and thank you for sharing this. I think it's great for a lot of our younger faculty to see how to approach a clinical problem in a methodical way. And obviously you've been successful getting grant funding for this. So while you pull up your next talk, I'm gonna just make a couple quick announcements. So one, after four months, tense, tense months of negotiations, I received a contract, signed contract from Roanoke. So we will be pulling out December 31st. So you can make your plans, resident. So that's official as of last night. I want to recognize our uh, uh, PGY4s that matched. Now we have four that are going into sports. I said when all of our residents in one year went into two, that went into, that we didn't have a resident going to hand one year, I would retire, but we only have four residents instead of our normal five. So I'm saying, <laughs> last year we had three out of five going to hand, so I'm, I'm okay. But uh, no, we have four who went into sports this year. Congratulations. Alyssa Elitoff is going to HSS. Neil Blanchard is going to Vail. Uh, uh, Pierce, uh, Pearson, again, is going to uh, Andrews Sports Medicine Institute. Thomas Moran is going to Rush. Four, the four top fellowship programs in the country for sports. Incredible accomplishment by all of you and what you've done here in your residency, but also it reflects the incredible reputation of our sports division and our faculty and of course our orthopedic department. So congratulations to all four of you. Sorry. HFS is up there, but you know, <laughs> we got some good ones. Alyssa, where are you? So you should meet Alyssa. She Looking forward to seeing you next year. Or two years. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. How much time do we have? 30 minutes. Okay. 35. All right. So taking a pretty big departure here. Um, I told Bobby that I, I, I changed my mind about this talk uh, about three days ago. So we're, we're trying this out for the first time, but I think it's important. Um, you know, I, I was thinking about all the trainees and being in your shoes. I can still very much remember being in uh, residency. And, you know, you're just trying to soak it in. You're trying to figure out what matters. Uh, you get all these talks by these luminaries and, you know, kind of have this uh, god slash goddess uh, like status. And you're trying to figure out where you fit in and how you get from where you are to, you know, where they are. And I'm not there yet, but, you know, trying to still, I guess, do the same thing. But I, I definitely have a little bit more insight into, you know, what I think matters and what I might have been mistaken about. Uh, and you don't usually get that perspective as you're kind of doing that. So I thought that, that could be uh, helpful. And so we'll, we'll see how that that goes. So, you know, uh, Dr. Chopper did uh, mention this is the last time. Uh, I was here a long time ago. I was actually uh, preparing for this talk and I, I was uh, looking through pictures and I uh, think, man, uh, I'm getting old. But uh, we, we did lose in triple overtime, Bobby, not uh, overtime. <clears throat> I definitely uh, still have some nightmares about that, uh, pushing a shot wide in that, that game over at Klockner. But 
fond and uh, difficult memories, as I said, uh, much more fond coming this time around to Charlottesville. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. You know, we spent uh, time touring around the undergrad uh, campus, the rotunda back there, seeing uh, uh, the basketball players uh, uh, do a little bit of their practice in the off season. And uh, it's been pretty remarkable. It's, uh, it's, it's a great town. And uh, it reminds me that uh, being on a true college campus definitely keeps you young. And, uh, you know, you kind of feel uh, the ethos of the place all around. So it's been it's been great. So talking a little bit about career, about success, and for me, um, certainly my parents, uh, you know, immediately come to mind. It's like if you were doing some kind of word association, you know, what has mattered? You know, my parents were formative, and I'm sure most folks in the room would say the same. Um, I grew up with a father who was a physician. Uh, pulmonologist, internal medicine doctor. Uh, so I always say he was the, the real doctor in the family. Uh, and there's no doubt that a lot of his joy uh, in terms of helping others definitely, you know, made uh, an effect on me, even if I, you know, wasn't sure what I was going to do at a young age. There's no doubt that a lot of those uh, direct and indirect lessons were really important. Uh, but as I Kind of reflect on who I am as a person, as a physician, as a surgeon, and the qualities that I think have been helpful. I actually think it's really my mother that has really been kind of the key part as I think about who she was and how she lived and, you know, what her personality was like. You know, she was sort of the hyper competitive one actually in the family. You know, no card game uh, was ever a uh, no big deal kind of thing in, in our family. She was a sports obsessed one, you know, and so, you know, I think a lot of my uh, love for sports uh, definitely came from her, uh, you know, incredibly empathetic, uh, really good at reading people. And these are all things that I, I use, you know, very much every day in clinical practice and I think uh, have been helpful. Um, when I think a little bit about, you know, what she would have wanted, and this is super painful because this is actually a really funny self deprecating picture. I can uh, cancel out of this for just a second. So this is me. Uh, and, you know, what I was saying here is that, you know, she definitely instilled in me a strong sense of self-worth, uh, self-belief, uh, and stubborn uh, refusal to give in, uh, even when your little baby sister's trying to get a little milk. And then, you know, the other picture is, you know, kind of riding a canoe on my own, you know, at uh, eight years old. And, and so those are all sort of things. So when you're kind of reflecting on who you are and what your um, attributes are, um, I think it's really important to kind of think about these things, both in terms of medicine, but just, you know, kind of in terms of your personality and use your strengths, right? We all have different strengths um, and they all probably will benefit you, but you have to kind of leverage what it is that kind of defines you. And, you know, one of the things that is true is that she always wanted me to just be happy, right? I mean, I think a lot of people, this is not like something unique. Um, interestingly, growing up both with me and with a physician for a husband, she was convinced that I would not be happy as a doctor. Uh, and, you know, subtly, you know, encouraged me to explore lots of different things. Uh, and, you know, probably some of that stubbornness that I uh, referenced um, end up fouling up her plans and, you know, went a different direction and, and here I am with you guys, right? Uh, and, you know, I, I am privileged to work at HSS, it's a wonderful place. Um, and so it kind of feels like, you know, winning the game, right? Um, but in many ways, when I reflect on, you know, where... I've been from training to early career to maybe mid career. You know, the question is, is it really winning, right? Uh, and when I reflect on what my mother would have wanted, right? She wanted me to be happy and she wanted me to be successful. I, I certainly had plenty of success, but if I am completely honest, you know, is happiness a major part of my day to day? Probably not, right? And that's something that sounds maybe more dark than, than I mean it to be, and I don't really mean it that way. Um, but I'm sure that's not foreign to a lot of folks in the room, right? I mean, I think you, you end up kind of compartmentalizing a lot of your life. You end up, you know, 
stressed out about lots of different things. You end up trying to, you know, have this delayed gratification kind of model. You're in training now. And, you know, when I get to where, you know, I want to be, where, you know, Dr. Chabra is, Dr. Hollenbeck is, I'm, I'm going to be happy then. It's not always happy, right? Uh, and so that was something that I started to reflect on, you know, sort of more and more, you know, what, what really matters, right? And, you know, this is, again, nothing. Um, so let me see if I can get rid of this for a second. Um, nothing novel here. You know, it really is about the journey. And, you know, when I think about being a resident, there's this story that's never died in, in our household, my wife. You know, intern year, I remember telling her, don't worry, intern year is just a drag. You know, no one really knows who you are and you're just doing all this kind of scut work. You know, once I'm a resident and not an intern, it's going to get better. And then second year, you spend, you know, in the you know darkness of the night, you're you know up at night, you know, putting on long leg splints, you're learning everything that you can about trauma and it's miserable, you know, and I spent probably more time at dinner, like with my head down, like sleeping, you know, kind of completely narcoleptic uh, than I did intern year. And I felt there, you know, don't worry. Um, it's been tough, you know, taking a lot of call. Once I'm a third year, it's like, you know, kind of a different residency. It's going to get better. And then what happened third year, right? So now some of your attendings know your name, maybe. Um, you kind of actually know how to, you know, dictate an op note. And so you write those 17 page long op notes because you're putting every little thing that you've done in there. And all of a sudden you start to feel stressed because you, you actually understand a little bit. And so now you feel this sort of unreasonable, but this new sense of responsibility because now you're kind of part of the team. And so now I'm starting to get stressed. Uh, which doesn't help, you know, family life. And I told her, well, third year, you know, it's kind of so important. I'm trying to set things up for fellowship. You know, once I'm a, you know, senior resident, it's going to get better. Fourth year, she looks at me and she said, it's never going to get better, is it? I said, no. <laughs> and it's kind of true, right? But it's perspective. Um, it's not that I would ever go back to being a resident. No chance of that as wonderful as it was, but I'm busier. I've got more stress. I've got more responsibilities. So using that same perspective, it's not any easier, right? Um, and so it is kind of true that if you look at all of your potential stressors all the time, you will be a miserable person, right? Because there's plenty to be stressed about. There's plenty that is not easy. And it's not necessarily happy, all of the goals that you are kind of looking at. So it really is about the journey. You have to find a way to find joy and meaning in the journey because it will always be one challenge after the next. And changing that perspective is super important to your kind of sense of fulfillment in what you're doing. And if you never change it, you will be miserable. Your family will be miserable. Um, and you're going to always wonder, you know, when am I going to quit? You know, why did I do this? All those things. Maybe some of you guys are already thinking that way. It just took me a long time to kind of figure that out because, it, you know, the weight of all these things, you know, was kind of always there. Um, I talked to a lot of our trainees about this fairy tale of, um, success in uh, surgery, in orthopedic surgery, plastic surgery, and beware of it. And what I mean by that is that you guys have all been to, you know, these like national conferences and you've seen these founders lectures or presidential address and people that you've looked up to your entire career. And they're all some version of the same story, right? It's to a lesser or greater degree, look at how many things I've accomplished. Um, usually giving some acknowledgement to family, but some sense that, you know, it's sort of some sense of like the humble brag, right? It's like, I've done a great job, you know, it sort of wasn't easy, but I'm kind of making it sound like it was easy. And, you know, 
have this sort of nonchalance about having achieved all these different things. And I remember being a trainee or maybe early in practice and thinking and listening to these talks and being amazed, honestly, you know, it's a lot of what made me want to be an academic surgeon. Uh, you know, the sense of, you know, accomplishment, not necessarily even from an individual standpoint, but from being able to achieve things that are meaningful to others was very powerful. But I also thought, I'm just struggling with being on night float. <laughs> and um, how could I ever possibly be able to do this? Because, you know, it just that sort of ease of being able to handle everything, I I'm struggling with just menial tasks, right? So maybe I'm not worthy. And um, that, that, that kind of lasted for a long time time. And that can lead to this subtle stress that actually leads to burnout and things of that nature, uh, if you're not careful. And what I wanted to say, and this is why I think it's important, you know, from my perspective, because I'm not at that level, uh, is that that's not reality. It's just not. And a lot of what you're seeing is this. And, you know, you put on a big show, because you're on the stage and you have done amazing things, there's no doubt. Um, you know, I've been really, really fortunate to have amazing mentors uh, who have done unbelievable things. And when I listen to them talk, I would think there's no chance that I could do any of those things because I've got all these different real life things that somehow they seem to have kind of skipped over. Um, but th they've been dealing with those things too. They just aren't talking about it. Um, and that may be a generational thing. Uh, maybe it's something about, um, you know, have a stiff upper lip and, you know, there, there's almost like a military esque kind of feel to surgery where you just kind of soldier on and, you know, that's just kind of the way it is. But again, I, I, I'm not sure it's doing like a lot of you guys in the back any, uh, service because it's, it's easy to say, well, I'm never going to be able to do any of those things. So I'm going to go, you know. Do something else. I'm not going to try to be like this person. It's just impossible. You know, maybe they lived in a time where, you know, no one cared about their family or, you know, you kind of just could be at work 24 seven. And that's, that's not me. And, and again, that's not really the truth. So um, I think there's some degree of toxicity to that kind of fairy tale story. Uh, and I guess this is in some ways uh, an attempt to kind of debunk that. So, you know, how could I uh, put my money where my mouth is. So you saw a picture of my mom and then this is her three years later. And she, this was 2015, she developed glioblastoma. So all those things that I was saying, you know, she was in many ways kind of the person that I thought gave me my life force that I was able to do whatever I needed to or wanted to do, gone like that. And, you know, I uh, ended up deciding not to stay at HSS, which I was going to do, uh, because my mentor there, Andy Wylan, who uh, Dr. Chopper knows very well, you know, told me that, look, when Richard Gelberman asked you to take a job, you take that job, you know. And so I, I moved to St. Louis. My wife, she's from New York, too. I told her, give me two years and two years turned into six years. And, you know, we were living life and there's always this sense of, well, can always go back to family, you know. I know they love me, they know I love them, you know. We'll, we'll get back there, you know. I gotta keep going. Life changes really quickly, you know. So, over the course of a year, she passed away. And uh, really, you know, it's funny because I haven't really told this story to too many people. Um, but a lot of why I decided to move back to New York was realizing in a very quick period of time that life can change just like that. And you, you never know if you're going to have the same opportunities uh, years later. So um, I was fortunate enough to be able to, you know, go back to special surgery where I had done my training. Um, it was very hard to leave my partners in St. Louis who I loved. Um, but, you know, your family is going to be important to you. And one of the things that has reinforced this to me so much is uh, kind of doing this historical hand surgery, some of the hand fellows here may know it, the Stern uh, journal articles. And, you know, one of the things I love to do is ask, like, who was 
Richard Gelberman or, you know, who is Peter Stern or, you know, who is, you know, Dick Smith. And <clears throat> the fellows don't know any of these people, you know, and uh, it's like, but, you know, these were like my luminaries. And so realizing that, honestly, people will forget who you are the second you're done is actually kind of a healthy thing to realize. Don't define yourself by this sense that I need others to pat me on the back. Do it for you, right? So um, that's really important, and it puts it in perspective. The people that really are there for you are your family, your friends, right? Uh, and you got to always kind of make sure that they remain at the center of all of your life, including as you go through all of your um, academic or professional um, uh, accomplishments. So for me, you know, that period of time was, was brutal, right? I mean, I was super busy. So, you know, Dr. Chopra told you that I was doing this you know, travel uh, fellowship. I was just kind of finally hitting, you know, um, that marathon speed from a career standpoint. And it just, it didn't make sense, right? And it took me a long time to start to kind of put everything back together. But I spent a long time kind of being miserable, even though I could kind of go through the motions. And for me, one of the biggest things that helped, and so I'm trying to pay it forward here, was listening to Jim Chang give his presidential address in 2018 at the Hand Society meeting. And so I just told you about this sort of what I've coined this toxic uh, fairy tale of success. And he just like smashed the whole thing to bits. And he goes up there, and I'd heard at this point plenty of these kind of um, presidential addresses, which are all some version of, of one another. And he goes 180. And he is raw and he's vulnerable. And he talks about his own like mental health struggles. He talks about, you know, basically all the things that I'm talking about right now. Um, you know, he had done a little bit of research about, you know, we've all now talked about burnout you know, to the nth degree, you know, the, the fact that there's a ton of burnout in surgery and orthopedics in uh, particular and in, in, in surgery in particular, and uh, that his message was, we need to acknowledge it. We need to reckon with it. We need to embrace kind of our uh, vulnerability and our humanity. And then we need to find the joy uh, that allows us to kind of continually self-renew. And it was like the perfect timing for me, honestly, to hear that kind of story from somebody who I always thought of as this too good to be true kind of person, and he kind of is. Um, and it was really, really impactful. So I remember, you know, kind of going up to him after he gave that talk and I told him like how amazing I thought it was. But initially I didn't tell him why I thought it was so amazing until about two years down the road. It was just a lot to throw at somebody when they're giving their presidential address. But it, it was really, really important. So I started to put together a lot of <clears throat> this at that time. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of different ways to look at this. <clears throat> but I started to self-reflect and I started to think, all right, well, what, what really, again, defines me? I talked a little bit about that in the beginning. And what do I actually really want? And, you know, there are a lot of different ways to kind of define that for myself. But there are a lot of things that I think start to get at the core of it. So for me, you know, I want to be reliable. I want to, you know, have some sense of fulfillment. Uh, I, I like to be outward looking, meaning, you know, give more than receive. Um, I want to be somebody who others can depend on, right? And, you know, Greg Popovich, before he went to um, the, um, San Antonio Spurs, uh, you know, had, had said this, the measure of who we are is how we react to something that doesn't go our way. And it made me think I was not doing that at all at that time. I was having a big time pity party. Uh, all the things that I yell at my kids now for, you know, this, it's not fair. Uh, that was totally, you know, very silently. I mean, probably no one knew that that was true. That's what I was doing. And, you know, I realized that is not kind of who I actually wanted to be or really felt like I was, but I was just stuck in that circle. And that's okay. So that's another kind of lesson. You don't have to be perfect. You're never going to be perfect, but you have to acknowledge what's actually going on and try to make it better. Right. And so that was kind of important for me. Love Kobe Bryant, always loved Kobe Bryant. 
And, you know, I love this quote. You know, he talks about this way of thinking that I think is really actually powerful. Obviously, he used it on the basketball court, but I really think it's so true in life. You know, this concept that he was sort of tougher, harder working, all this other stuff than anybody else. And that's what made him great. That's only part of it. Right. You know, he talked about that. He has self-doubt. He has insecurity, his fear, fear of failure. But he doesn't deny it. He embraces it. And I think that that's super important, you know, and it's something that I say to my kids now, and I think it's very true, you know, being a brave person is not always knowing that you can handle some challenge. It's not knowing that you can handle the challenge and still doing it, right? And I think that's very important. And that reflects reality because you, you guys are all super talented, smart. You're going to be able to handle 99% of things. But you have to be able to deal with that 1% in order to keep on growing. So that's really important as well. And then going back to this concept, and, you know, it was a little bit of setup for this slide. But, you know, I said my mom wanted me to be successful and happy. And when I really think about it, it isn't really happiness that drives me. So it was kind of a trick. Uh, happiness is great. Who doesn't want to be happy? But it's not really what ultimately makes me click, Right. And I think it's partially because of this. It's that I never really wanted to be comfortable. I, that feels stagnant to me. And, you know, when I think about it, you know, there's plenty of, you know, talks, TED Talks about this kind of thing. Um, but growth happens when you are in an uncomfortable state, right? You have to kind of push outside of your boundaries in order to keep on growing. And it's the growth that kind of inspires me. It's the growth that kind of made me want to be an academic surgeon you know, the intellectual curiosity with those kind of things, having a challenge that you're not sure how to solve just yet, you know, 10 years later, thinking about this ulnar nerve stuff. That's what fills my bucket, so to speak. I have this book for my kids called, you know, Have You Filled Your Bucket Today, uh, which is a great book for anybody that has kids, by the way, but come ask me about that later. And, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, psychological research on this kind of topic, and Maslow's hierarchy is something that, you know, a lot of folks in the psychological literature will talk about. And, you know, again, this is kind of where things came full circle for me. You know, we talk about the different hierarchy of needs, and, you know, the basics need to be there before you can kind of move up the chain. And I think whether it's already happened for you or whether it will happen, you're going to experience something that knocks you down the rungs and gives you some sense of insecurity about something fundamental, right? Some things that you need to be happy, whether it's just, you know, probably none of us are likely to have problems with food and, and shelter, thank God, you know, uh, being in a wonderful field. But there's something that will happen with your relationships, with, you know, something, uh, family that will leave you needing to address those things in order to move back up the rungs. And for me, again, this is where kind of, you know, what defined you, I would say for me, being able to pay it forward, to pay, you know, homage to parents, family, mentors, uh, to pass on knowledge uh, is kind of where I feel my biggest sense of fulfillment uh, that makes me the most whole. And you need to make sure that the bottom rungs are kind of taken care of first before you can kind of get there. Uh, and I think that's where um, probably the message is, is the most important. So it's not that there's anything wrong with happiness. In fact, I think you need to make sure that you remain a happy person. But you have to figure out what gets you to that you know, level of self-transcendence, because that's where you avoid the burnout. Right. So I would say that you need to make sure that you care for yourself first. It's like, you know, watering your plants. That's a big part of it. Uh, and whatever it is that you need to be who you are, you need to make sure you're doing those things, which is not always easy. I I'm terrible at it personally, but I think it's important so that, again, you have that foundation to kind of get to that you know, next level where you are going to be the most effective caretaker of your patients, you know, um, mentor to your um, trainees, um, you know, leaders in your communities, uh, et cetera. Um, there's a whole bunch of things that honestly could fit this slide, but, you know, I think, although a lot of it has been kind of on the touchy feely side, 
I do think an important thing for the trainees is that you need to lean in to hard work. And one of the things that I talk to our trainees about is that if you see a lot of the things that are asked of you as burdens that someone else is asking you to do, you're going to be miserable. If you see it as something that betters yourself, that is for you, it will be not just easier to deal with, but something that you embrace. And I think actually that's something that I always kind of naturally, for better or for worse, kind of understood, but it makes so much more sense in this context, especially thinking about things like burnout and all the other things that we've talked about over the last five years, understanding that this is the way that you should be selfish. You should be doing these things for you. You shouldn't feel that this is something that you are doing for somebody else because it will bring you a greater sense of accomplishment, joy, fulfillment in your career. For me, volunteerism is really important. Um, you know, behind the pictures here, uh, I, I went to Princeton, as a, you know, I mentioned, and, you know, we have this sort of informal kind of motto in the nation's service and in the service of humanity. And I've always kind of believed that, you know, serving others is the way to, again, a greater sense of fulfillment uh, and purpose. And that's been a huge thing for me. So another kind of tip is find ways to, to give. Uh, we've all been super, super fortunate in our lives, um, even when it doesn't always feel that way. Um, volunteerism has given me um, a sense of um, emotional and mental uh, renewal. You know, when I have a super busy month, you know, at work, and then I'm, you know, Bobby and I were just talking about having to, you know, go to Israel and, you know, for uh, the combined Israeli and American Hand Society meeting, and then we have a council meeting two weeks later. Sounds kind of crazy, but, you know, being around smart, like-minded people who also have this passion to serve, you know, is really kind of uh, something that, again, sort of fills that bucket, makes it a lot easier to go back to the grind. Uh, so find ways to serve um, or find something that kind of inspires you, even if it's not, you know, volunteerism. And then, you know, don't forget your family. You know, I'm kind of going full circle again. You know, I, um, I think that you got to have your home base. Uh, you guys are always going to be busy. You're always going to have too many things to do. Um, you know, my family is my, my rock for sure. And, you know, it's funny, this picture on the left side was taken uh, within a couple of weeks of moving back to New York um, when we were still in a high rise building. And it's kind of crazy to think that my kids have, you know, grown so much. And, you know, Bobby's got, you know, two kids in, in college and, you know, he and I are 10 years apart and our kids are about 10 years different. So kind of similar trajectory. So you can see how it goes in a blink of an eye. They're going to be the ones that are going to remember you, uh, whether you were there or whether you weren't there. And so, you know, make sure that uh, the lessons are good because that's what's going to sustain you in the long haul. So that's what I got for you guys. I really appreciate you listening. Thanks, Anna. Remarkable talk, and thank you for sharing that story and, and the tools you've used to stay happy and stay uncomfortable to keep growing, right? Yep. I can. I hope you all see what, how it's been such a privilege for me to work with Dan over these last few years in the Hand Fellowship Directors Association and on council. He's a remarkable person, and he's a quiet guy, but when he speaks at council meetings, everyone listens. And it's because he has some very impactful and, and meaningful things to say. And I think you saw that today. So, and thank you very much. Some, some swag thank from you. UVA. And uh, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. It's been fantastic. So thank you all for attending. And uh, if you have any questions, please come on and talk to Dr. Ose. We have uh, hand uh, case presentations here from 9 to 11. So we'll start up at nine again for those who are interested in staying. Uh, and we have five or six cases to present um, uh, before Dr. Say has to leave. So um, thank you all, and uh, I hope you all enjoy.